The Dassault Mirage was a lightweight, all-weather interceptor designed in the late 1950s and entering service with various nations from 1961. Able to achieve speeds in excess of Mach 2 and featuring good manoeuvrability, along with the possibility of fitting it with a variety of external armaments, it proved itself a very formidable fighter. Join me in this video as I build the 1 to 48th scale plastic model kit of the Mirage 3C from Academy. Hi, I'm Matt and you're watching Model Minutes. If you'd like to see an in-depth review of this model kit, take a look at my unboxing video I made previously. For this video I'll be focusing on the build and drawing a conclusion on this model. Before I start the build, as always, please remember that adult supervision may be required due to the use of sharp tools and toxic paints and chemicals. Academy recommends this kit to those aged 14 and over. So let's get into it. I couldn't find any suggestions on the included paperwork to wash the model prior to assembly. This is normally a good thing to do as it gives a clean surface for the paint and cement to stick to. As it was omitted however, and as I'm a glutton for punishment, I decided to see how well this would actually build if you were to not complete this step. Throughout this build I will remove the plastic parts from the sprue using either a sharp knife or my snips. Any flash or excess plastic can be cut away with a knife or sanded smooth using some sanding sticks. I started by cutting the cockpit components away from their respective sprues. You'll notice that I have removed the Pilot 2. As I mentioned in my previous unboxing video, I'd probably use him in this one, but taking a closer look at him I just couldn't bring myself to do it. He's pretty much a lump of plastic in a sort of human form, so I'm just going to leave the cockpit empty for this build. The control column is glued into the floor of the cockpit, which I used Revell Contactor Professional Cement to do. I find the needle applicator on this product to be quite useful. I do also use Tamiya Extra Thin Cement in this build too, as that can flow into gaps that this glue can't reach. The pilot seat was next to be added, which needs to have the top part cemented to it. This was a little pain, as there were no locating marks to help get it in the right place. The nose wheel was next to be added to the little base plate that will hold it inside the model later. The fit on this was quite loose, so needed to be held in place until the cement had started to cure. The air intakes come in two halves, and these need gluing together. You have to make sure you match the right ones up though. If you get it wrong, they won't sit flush to each other and will look odd but at least this is a 50-50 chance of getting it wrong. And no my luck, I actually did. But I corrected this error. The fuselage halves were next to be removed from the sprue and cleaned up. This will take a little work to make sure you get rid of the excess plastic left over from the sprue. The cockpit I previously assembled was installed into one half of the model, which was then followed by the equipment block behind the pilot's seat. You'll notice that the detail is very simple on the inside of the cockpit. At least it is in my opinion. Academy seem to disagree though, as they stated on the box that it has a highly detailed cockpit interior. But I'll let you draw your own conclusions. Next, the landing gear I made earlier was also glued into this area. The moulded guidelines are actually quite handy here, but you might still have to hold it in place to stop it falling over until the cement cures. It's stated on the instructions that weight has to be added to the nose to prevent the model from sitting on its tail when it's finished. How much though is anyone's guess. I simply packed the nose with as much sticky tack as I could. I like using this as it fills the gaps and can be compressed quite easily. I didn't think this would be enough though, so I got some more sticky tack and just rammed as much as I could in the large space forward of the main landing gear. Hopefully this will be enough. It's time to close up the fuselage now, so cement was run along the edges and the two halves joined together. 
These parts fit quite well, with only some very minor adjustments needed. It would be a good idea to tape or clamp these parts until the cement cures, but I just held it together with my hands for the most part. But a clothes peg did make an appearance on the tail surface. Tamiya extra thin cement was run along the seams, and this would help ensure a good bond. This cement tends to run into those seams under capillary action, helping to improve the adhesion. The air intakes that were previously made can now be glued into place on the sides of the fuselage. If you made these the right way round, they should fit without any issues. The control panel parts can now be added to the front of the cockpit area. These come in two parts and have no locating marks, so once again it can be difficult to get them aligned correctly. Just take your time here. I gently manipulated the control panel with a knife to get it to sit right before the cement cured. The jet exhaust nozzle can now be added to the rear of the model. Again, there are no locating pins for this part either so you have to line this up by eye. It's worth mentioning that there is no engine details for inside this kit, so if you look down the nozzle of the aircraft, you'll just see a big void. It's something I can live with, but a little annoying when you do notice it. Some tiny little air intakes need to be glued to the top of the aircraft, there are these little moulded rectangles on the surface of the aircraft, which they get cemented onto. But again, running theme in this one, no moulded locating pins or holes provided, so it's a matter of lining it up by eye again. Having removed the wing components from the sprue, it's time to add this weird little plastic bit into the inside of the lower wing. This does something for the landing gear area, but I'm not entirely sure why it exists. It looks like it creates a slot for one of the underslung armaments, but I feel that it should have just been moulded into the plastic to start with. But, oh well, it's done now. The top wing surfaces are now glued into their respective positions. This is a pretty easy step, but you need to make sure they align properly and are held into place until the cement dries. With that done, the wings can be cemented to the fuselage. They fit well, and I found I would not need to use any fillet at the joins for the wings. A nice little treat. The landing gear legs can now be cemented onto their slots. These are very shallow slots, and I found that the legs just wanted to fall over all the time, so just watch out for that. The bottom of the model needs to have some more of those little air intakes that we did on the top, except this time they are facing the other direction, so are these actually vents of some kind? The two pylons for the drop tanks were cemented into their slots in the wings. You just have to make sure that you cement them the right way round, as the drop tanks will sit too far rearwards when you come to install them otherwise. This central spoiler type part is now glued to the rear of the underside of the model. Again, just be careful and make sure it's vertical as it dries. These two strips of plastic are now cemented into their slots towards the rear of the wings. I think that they might operate the control surfaces of the aircraft in real life, but I could be wrong. The outboard pylons are next to be added. Again, just make sure they are vertical and not drooping to one side as they dry. The final pylon is now added in the center of the aircraft. It fits into that weird slot that we made earlier before we joined the wings together. Now it's time to add the landing gear doors for the nose wheel, which due to some amazing camera work on my part, it's just off the top of the video. The doors consist of a larger one for the main bay cover, but there are also two part ones on the actual landing gear leg, one part slots on top of the other, a bit like roof slates. The main landing gear doors are simply cemented into place, but I found that the numbers on the instructions were actually reversed. This would result in the covers being on the wrong sides. I noticed this due to the fact that when I imagined the landing gear being closed, there was no physical way the covers would fit in their slots. I ended up reversing them. 
You could depict this with its wheels up if you wished, simply omitting the landing gear and cementing these covers in the slots in the underside of the aircraft. The two drop tanks come in four parts, two large halves of the main body of the tank and then two little stabilizers for the tips of the little wings. The halves simply cement together and then the stabs are added on the ends of the wings. Make sure you get these the right way round as these do, surprisingly, have little locating tabs moulded into them. Also, make sure they are vertical as they dry. The large central missile, at least I think it's a missile, is now assembled. The two main parts are joined together without any issues. It comes with some of the fins needing to be added though, but they simply cement into their respective slots. This missile can then be glued onto the central pylon with the two drop tanks going on the next two pylons either side. The two outermost pylons will be left for now as I intend to paint the missiles on those separately and add them later. With that said, it's time to start painting. I started off with this cheap matte black spray paint. I'm going to use this on the cockpit and simply spray the whole area matte black. I did this using careful side to side motion, leaving time between coats to dry and then recoat to get into all of those little gaps. Probably a first on my channel, masking the canopy. I know I've used liquid masking fluid before, but for this one I chose to use masking tape exclusively. You can see that I've already masked most of the canopy. My method was to use a really sharp knife and use the lines on my cutting mat as a guide to get the strips of tape to the right length. I then carefully placed them on the canopy with any excess being trimmed away. I made sure that the right parts were completely covered so that I couldn't accidentally spray the canopy in the wrong areas. Fingers crossed this works, but I won't know until later. I used a fine brush and Humbrol 24 matte trainer yellow acrylic on the little hoop on the top of the pilot's seat. I'm pretty sure this is an ejection seat trigger, so it was given some little yellow and black stripes. Humbrol 64 light grey matte acrylic was dry brushed on the control panel and some of the other areas of the cockpit. This meant that most of the paint was removed from the brush, leaving it feeling dry. Then the residue collects on the raised details and helps to highlight them as you brush over them. I used a general purpose glue to stick the clear part which represents the heads up display onto the cockpit. I'm using this glue as it dries clear and quite quickly whilst not fogging up the clear plastic which poly cement can do. I then repeated the process with the same glue to attach the cockpit canopy to the model. It fits quite well and didn't need any filler to be applied. The probe on the nose of the model can now be added. Take care from now on as this can be easily knocked and bent as you handle it. I used this cheap black gloss spray paint as a base on the entire model. Again working in a sweeping motion to get good even coverage. I do end up doing most of my spraying outside to help protect my lungs, but you get the idea here. With the model now painted and dry, you can see that this cheap paint has resulted in a slightly blotchy gloss effect, not all areas being as glossy as others, but this shouldn't matter too much. Now it's time to use this cheap metallic silver spray paint in exactly the same way. I'll use it to cover the entire model and make sure I get into all those little nooks and crannies. When the silver had dried, I masked off the nose of the aircraft using tape and the instructions. I use the instructions simply to make sure that the paint doesn't go on the rest of the model. Careful control of the spray paint will be needed here to make sure it only goes on the nose. The matte black spray paint is making a reappearance to do this job. With that paint now dry, I carefully removed the masking tape and I was pretty happy with how it had turned out. A nice neat difference between the two colours was visible, with no bleed being present. Now it's decal time. 
I don't need to apply a gloss or satin base to the model as it's already shiny from the silver. So I crack straight on with cutting the decal sheet into more manageable sections. The decals were then soaked in warm water and allowed to release from the backing paper. I used Microset first as a base for the decal. This solution will be brushed in the areas that the decal would be applied, and it helps soften it onto the surface. After a little while, Micro Sol in the red bottle would be brushed over the top and help increase the softening effect and help it stick further. But, and it's a big but, I was warned by various people that these decals would be no good. And if I'm completely honest, they were not great. On the flat surfaces, those decals applied well, with no silvering appearing in the transfer film. They didn't soften into the details of the kit as much as I would have liked though. The large red ones on the air intakes behind the cockpit were the worst offenders. They don't seem to be quite the right shape to fit onto the model properly. No matter how you apply them, they will be slightly wonky, or leave gaps where they shouldn't. Also, I found they didn't bend around the surfaces quite right, and left little folds. I did end up having to cut some of the clear film, which didn't fold around the plastic surfaces, and I used a knife to do that a little bit later. The blue arrows on the tail seemed a bit big too. They didn't really fit where they were supposed to, as indicated on the instructions. Generally, the decals were a bit translucent, and you could see through them. They didn't really apply to the surface well, and seemed to be a bit plasticky and reluctant to soften. I did persevere though, and eventually got them all in more or less the right place. Next, I applied some masking tape to the panel line around the rear of the aircraft. Humbrol 53 Gunmetal Grey was thinned with Tamiya X20A acrylic thinners, and then carefully applied to the jet nozzle area. A few thin coats would be needed to get the desired metallic effect. This plastic coat spray satin varnish was now used to protect and seal the decals and give the model a uniform finish. Again, I worked in side to side motion, ensuring full coverage of the model. With that paint drying, it was time to paint the missiles with this cheap matte white spray paint. I left them still on the sprue to make it easier and prevent them from blowing away in the spray. Now it's the moment of truth. How has my masking of the cockpit turned out? I carefully peel the masking tape away using a pointed stick to pull up a corner, then tweezers to remove the various pieces of tape. To my relief, this has turned out really well. Citadel Known Oil was the next product to be used. I'm going to apply this wash to the various panel lines and details on the model with a medium fine brush. When it's had some time to dry, I soaked some cotton buds in Tamiya acrylic thinners and then brushed the excess wash away. I try and do this in the direction of airflow over the aircraft to try and give subtle yet realistic staining. With the excess wash removed, the recess details now have contrast and can be seen better. The two main wheels were stuck to some sticky tack and then given a coat of the same metallic silver spray paint from before. When the paint was dry, I masked the silver hubs of the wheels using some more sticky tack, trying to work it into the right areas and cover them properly. Next, the matte black spray was used to cover the entire wheel. I found that it wasn't as matte as I would like, being slightly shiny from the silver underneath it. I'll fix this in a minute though. The front wheel, which comes moulded as part of the landing gear leg, so couldn't be easily masked and sprayed. Instead, I used Humbrol 33 matte black acrylic and a medium fine brush to carefully paint this part. I thinned the paint to help improve its flow and avoid leaving brush strokes. I also use this black paint on the nose and exhaust of the two missiles. I scraped some paint from the remaining pylons and missiles, then glued them together. 
Again, care must be taken to make sure it hangs correctly and doesn't droop to one side or the other. Now back to the main wheels. I remove the sticky tack to reveal a reasonably well finished wheel, but as previously mentioned it wasn't quite right. I went back over the black areas with the same thin Tumbrel 33 matte black acrylic from painting the nose wheel. I took care to avoid the silver wheel hubs, but it helped in dulling down the shine on the tyres. When dry, the wheels could be added onto their legs and cemented into place. I found that the protruding pin was quite long, so decided to cut the excess off. And here's the finished model. Like I mentioned in my previous unboxing video, I built this as part of my Discord group build with the theme of vintage sonic booms. So what do I think of this kit? I bought this for £8.75 in the UK and it felt like that was quite cheap for a 148 scale kit, but actually, having now built this, it seems about right. The quality is okay, the plastic doesn't have much flash and the moulded details are good. Also, the fit is generally quite good as I didn't need to use any filler during this build. The fact that the box advertises a French decal scheme but actually only includes a decal scheme for a Mirage 3C of the Six Day War in 1967 uh, for the Israeli Air Force is definitely misleading. As to the fact that it states that it has a highly detailed cockpit, though as you saw, the cockpit isn't really detailed at all. That's not to mention the lack of internal engine detail, which can be seen from the rear of the aircraft looking up the jet nozzle. The pilot though, he was so bad that I just, I just couldn't use it. The instructions are not great, but they are easy to follow and not particularly complicated. The biggest letdown though, as I was rightly warned about, was the decals. They were usable, but they weren't great. They didn't really conform to the surfaces, they were plasticky and translucent, and even the setting solutions didn't seem to help much. In the future, I would probably get an aftermarket set for this kit from a better decal manufacturer. I think the big positives in this kit though, are that it's really quite simple to build and the paint scheme was easy to apply, particularly with my use of spray paints. It only took me a couple of days to finish this one and I used it as a mojo build to help give me some motivation for modelling. This kit would also be fantastic as a test bed for modelling skills and scratch building as, let's face it, it could do with some detailing work. Now let's talk about the history of the model. It would seem, according to scalemates.com, which is a fantastic modelling resource by the way, if you're not familiar with it, this kit was originally toured by Fujimi in 1968 and sold as being 150th scale. It had a few new parts added to it until Academy also started using the tool in 1985. Some parts of this kit don't seem like they date to the 1960s though, particularly those recessed panel lines, but other elements like the pilot and cockpit don't surprise me at all. This particular version of the kit dates from around 2010-ish. There doesn't seem to be a hard date on this one, but a copyright on the box dates to 2009. This kit has been available in a few different decal schemes, and there may still be some around. I know I saw some in a model shop recently, but I think that was in a camouflage paint scheme, possibly French. So let's wrap this one up. This has been a fun kit to build, which, although it's had its challenges, I really enjoyed building it and it was just enough to help me get some motivation back. Anyway, I'd be interested to know, would you get one of these for yourself? As always, comments on my build, techniques and finished model are always welcome under the video. Honourable mention to my patrons over on Patreon, whose amazing support allows me to go out and buy all of the things I need to continue building kits. You know, paint, glue, more kits, a massive thank you to you guys. Take a look at the link in the description to find out more about what pledging your support gets you, including things like behind the scenes stuff and early access to videos. Don't forget that you can connect with me on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. I've also got a Discord server with a fantastic group of modelers in there right now and more groups should be happening there in the future too. 
All that's left to say is thanks for watching and I'll see you all on the workbench again next time.